subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to rao's ias dns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 30th march 2022 we shall pick up articles only relevant to the civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of this exam before we begin with today's discussion there is a very important announcement for you prelims compass have started to come out in the market the compass for economic survey and the compass for history and culture they are already out on amazon the link to the compass would be given in the description section it's high time that you buckle up take too many tests solve too many questions and use the compass material as the last time revision source this is a lead article from today's newspaper what is wrong with saffronizing education if we look at this article from the perspective of civil service examination this article talks about the ill effect the harm caused by mechanization of indian education system upsc previously has asked many times questions on development of education system during the time of british let's have a discussion regarding the same from the perspective of prelims examination development in the education field during the colonial regime can be conveniently discussed under two different education policies the first policy was followed by the east india company till 1813 this is called as the orientalist policy this policy got drastically changed from 1813 onwards till the second world war see the colonial era started in india with the entrenchment of east india company with mercantile interest and in this phase of the mercantile interest they had no role to play in the education development directly because they didn't have any political control but you would know that the company was obliged to bring christian missionaries on their ships and protect them according to the charter given to the company the christian missionaries did start their activities and open schools elementary education right from the ancient time over the medieval period and before the britishers got strong hold over the land was highly decentralized and in this decentralized architecture of elementary education missionary activities added another layer another structure in the indigenous education system so during the mercantile phase east india company did not influence the education system of india as such directly but the situation got changed when the east india company started conquering territories and ruling over them under the protection of british empire missionaries activities were received with hostility by indian upper caste whose support as such was required by the company in consolidating their position in india so they were not too willing to interfere in the educational sphere of india even though there was some pressure from the british statesmen the politico economic compulsion of the period compelled the rulers the east india company to adopt a pro native education system policy and hence in 1781 calcutta madrasa was started to conciliate the influential hindus and muslims calcutta madrasa remember was the first educational institute set up by east india company in 1784 asiatic society of bengal was founded by william jones and around this time charles wyken started bhagavad gita translation into english in line with calcutta madrasa 10 years later in 1791 jonathan duncan founded the sanskrit college for the study of hindu laws and philosophies the students from these colleges mostly belonged to the elite hindu and muslim families and they obtained higher posts in the company and therefore had their support in this phase apart from starting a few sanskrit and persian higher learning centers and restricting the activities of the missionaries in their own political interest the company did not spend any money on the education at school level in 1800 governor general richard wellesley founded the fort william college in calcutta basically to train the civil servants of east india company in indian languages and indian customs but unfortunately just in 2 years it was shut down because the british administration back in england did not approve because they considered this indianization of english civil servants the charter of 1813 is considered as a first noted step towards modern education in the country by british but however this was not very encouraging because just a meager sum of rupees 1 lakh was earmarked for educating the indian subjects the entire of india the present india bangladesh pakistan the entire region 
with just rupees 1 lakh. Now at this juncture, there was a debate about the line of expenditure of this amount. Some said that it should go for oriental education and the others said that the sum was to be spent for English education. Raja Ramohan Roy was in favour of spending the money in western education. But this was not done. The General Committee of Public Instruction in 1823 decided to spend the money on oriental studies. This decision by the General Committee of Public Instruction was taken in 1823 and there is some background to it. You see, in the initial mercantile interest phase, the Britishers did not do anything because they didn't have any political control. And when they began to have political control, they were in dire need of support of upper caste of Hindus and Muslims to consolidate the power and position that they have acquired. But situations gradually changed. By the end of 17th century, British already had consolidated their position and the mercantile interest had been replaced by the industrial interest. The industrial interest of the British saw India a market for their products. And by the end of the 17th century, Charles Grant, he was an influential English statesman and he also became later chairman of the board of directors of East India Company and was advocating that English education to be introduced in India. His lobby was called as Anglicist. They were challenging the position of Orientalist. The tussle was going on continuously and Lord Babington Macaulay, he became the law minister of the Governor General Lord William Bentick. This law minister of the Governor General heard the arguments of both parties and rejected the position of Orientalist. Lord Macaulay has great influence on the education system of India presently as well. You must be aware that Lord Macaulay also wrote the Indian Penal Code. The education system that we are trying to change so hard, established by a man who also established the Indian Penal Code. You must have heard the phrase minutes of meeting that gives out the details as to what was discussed and what decision was taken. Taking vocabulary from there, the famous Macaulay Minute. Macaulay Minutes refers to the decision finally taken on the debate of Orientalist versus Anglicist. Lord Macaulay forcefully supported the cause of English education in Indian territories. According to Macaulay, the immediate objective of education was to prepare a class of people who can occupy the subordinate position in the colonial government and help in administering the natives. In the long run, the education was meant for westernizing the elite who in turn would influence the masses to facilitate the conversion of India into a market to consume the industrial products industrial products of Europe and supply the industries based in Britain with the raw material. You see, when their interests changed, their position changed. In 1837, English language became the official language and soon a demand for English education was created by throwing open the subordinate positions in the government for the native in 1844. And this policy hugely attracted the native ruling classes towards English education institutions. But they didn't bother about the primary education. Lord Macaulay was very ignorant of richness of Indian literature, Indian philosophy, Indian thoughts. He has famously remarked, a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. The gist of Macaulay's minute is that government should spend resources for teaching Western sciences and literature in English alone. English should be made the medium of education in schools and colleges. In Macaulay's minute, elementary schools were not given importance. Rather, most schools at district levels and colleges were suggested to be opened. Hence, mass education was neglected. And we have talked about this downward filtration theory that British decided to educate a small section of upper and middle class Indians who would then act as bridge between masses and the government. And this educated would spread Western education to the masses gradually. But you see, there was some undercurrent of changes. James Jonathan did some experiment in the Northwest province during 1843 to 1853. In the northwestern province, he introduced one model school in each tehsil, where the vernacular language was used for teaching, and there was another school for training of teachers. Previously, there has been some report given on the vernacular education in Bengal and Bihar. It was published in 1835, 36, and again in 38. These reports pointed out the defects in the system of vernacular education. 
The next major landmark in the development of education system during the British rule was Wood's Dispatch. Wood's Dispatch is also known as Magna Carta of English Education in India. It was a comprehensive plan for mass education in India. See, Charles Wood was a British liberal politician and member of parliament. Later, he became the president of the Board of Control of East India Company. And in 1854, he sent the Woods Dispatch to the Governor General. And who was the Governor General back then? Lord Dalhousie. As per this dispatch, there should be secular education in government schools. There must be an education department in every province. Universities modeled on the line of London University should be established in big cities like Bombay, Calcutta and Madras. The recommendation was to establish at least one government school in every district. And affiliated private schools can be given grants. Remember that Woods Dispatch recommended that Indian natives should be given training in their mother tongue also. Woods Dispatch actually prompted government to take responsibility for education. Woods Dispatch was a very influential document. In accordance with Woods Dispatch, education departments were established in every province. And universities were opened at Calcutta, Bombay and Madras in 1857. And later on, Punjab University in 1882 and Allahabad University in 1887 were also opened. But you see, these universities merely functioned as examining bodies and there were no teaching. The students appeared for the examination through their own studies under a tutor or they studied through affiliated private educational institutions. And primary education was still suffering. But in 1882, Hunter Commission on Indian Education System was commissioned. Hunter Education Commission was a landmark commission appointed by Lord Ripon. Lord Ripon was one of the most beloved Governor General. The objective was to look into the complaints of the non-implementation of Woods Dispatch of 1854 and also to look into the contemporary status of elementary education in the British territories and suggest means by which this can be extended and improved. Hunter Commission brought out the neglect of the primary and secondary education in the country and recommended that the responsibility of the primary education must be given to the local boards and municipal boards. This was the first commission that paid attention and gave recommendation for primary education. Remember, Hunter Commission of 1882. It recommended that more government efforts are required for improvement of mass education through vernacular languages. Transfer of control of primary education to, of the new districts to municipal boards. The commission recommended to encourage female education. Secondary education must be divided into two categories, literary and vocational. Previously, university education began right after class 10th. But then the structure was changed to the structure that exists presently. After 10th, there was an intermediate phase of 11th and 12th and then university. This class 11th, 12th still today is called as intermediate. These two classes were created as a bridge between class 10th and university education. And this was considered to be complete education in itself. In 1902, Rayleigh Commission was appointed. By whom? By Lord Curzon. Lord Curzon was filled with his imperialistic design and was not in favor of giving any power to Indians. He considered the Indian universities and colleges to be becoming cradle of propaganda against the government. So with the idea to bring control over universities, Lord Curzon appointed Rayleigh Commission by Sir Thomas Rayleigh. The commission submitted its report and based on the merit of the report, a bill was introduced called as Rayleigh Bill. The Rayleigh Bill, as it is popularly called, became an act. The name of the act was Indian Universities Act 1904. There is a sharp contrast between the Hunter Commission appointed by Lord Ripon and Rayleigh Commission appointed by Lord Curzon. The Hunter Commission of 1882 left the university education completely and emphasized upon the primary education. On the contrary, Rayleigh Commission excluded the primary education completely and emphasized upon higher education only. For the purpose of exam, you must know some basic features of Indian Universities Act 1904. First of all, the Act brought all Indian universities under the control of government. The Act emphasized on the attention to study and research in universities rather than revolutionary and political activities. They reduced the number of fellows and they were to be nominated by the government. This was done on the pretext of maintaining the quality in the universities. 
The control was so high that the government acquired veto power against the university's senate decisions and the rules of affiliation were made very strict. You must remember that in 1906, the princely state of Baroda introduced compulsory primary education in its territory. This was the first time any part of India, whether in British India or princely state, compulsory primary education concept was introduced. While the Hunter Commission had reported problems of secondary education and the University Commission of 1902, the Sattler Commission reviewed the entire field of education from school education right till university education. Sadler Commission was actually initially appointed to look into the performance of Calcutta University but however eventually it ended up reviewing up all universities in the country and all the stages of education. Sadler Commission observed that the improvement of secondary education is necessary for the improvement of university education and school education must be completed in 12 years. The students must enter the university after an intermediate stage, not directly after class 10 as it was the case earlier. A. It will better prepare the students for university and B. It will reduce the pressure on universities. C. The intermediate stage can also be used to provide vocational education for those who do not plan to get into universities. There was a recommendation for separate board for secondary and intermediate education. For the first time, it was recommended that university should function as a centralized and resident teaching autonomous body. Previously, universities were just examining bodies. Students do not used to stay inside the university throughout the British rule. Since females were not participant in the administration, female education was neglected. The commission recommended to correct that. Just like Hunter Commission, Sadler Commission also recommended the use of mother tongue, the vernacular languages as a medium of instruction in the intermediate colleges. Hunter Commission recommended that for primary education, but Sadler Commission recommended that for intermediate stage as well. And the education was to be made a provincial subject. From the perspective of prelims examination, these recommendations, these committees on educations are very, very important. These recommendations were accepted gradually. After independence, you know the establishment of UGC, University Grant Commission in 1953. It was done on the recommendation of Radha Krishna Commission and Radha Krishna Commission was based on the similar line as Sadler University Commission. In 1920, the Sadler Commission recommendations were handed over to the provincial government as education was sifted under provinces. The Montague Clemsford reform accepted the recommendation of making education a provincial subject. But this step also caused financial crunch in the education sector. In 1929, Hartung Committee submitted its report. The committee was appointed to survey the growth of education in British India. And remember that this committee devoted more attention to mass education than secondary and university education. The recommendation was to provide primary education, but it did not recommend. Rather, it recommended that compulsory education system was not needed. So it was not compulsory primary education. Only deserving students should be allowed to study in high schools and intermediate stages, whereas average students should be diverted to vocational courses. It again recommended restricted admission in universities to improve standards of universities. In 1937, Vardha Committee of Basic Education was established by Indian National Congress. Congress organized a national conference on education in Vardha and formulated a committee under Zakir Hussain for basic education. The Vardha scheme focused on learning through activity and this was based on Gandhiji's idea and it was published in Harijan. Learning through activity included basic handicrafts making. First seven years of schools to be free and compulsory. Remember this fact for the exam. Hindi as medium till class 7 and English from class 8th onward. However, these ideas were not implemented as you know that Congress resigned from the provincial government due to the start of World War II. The last thing that you need to take note of in this topic is the Sergeant Plan of Education by the Central Advisory Board of Education of 1944. The recommendation was to have free primary education for 3 to 6 years of age. This we do not have till date. What you have to remember extremely important for the exam compulsory education for 6 to 11 years of age. 
we have compulsory education now till 14 years of age from 6 to 14 this was the first committee of the british that suggested compulsory education at the primary level the commission observed that the high school education should on no account be considered simply as a preliminary to university education but as a stage complete in itself it will however remain a very important function of high schools to pass their most able pupils to universities i told you education till class 12 was considered to be complete in itself the committee also recommended focusing on teachers training physical education and education of mentally and physically handicapped students so much should suffice from this topic this article is from page number 12 opposition mps voice support for trade union strike expressing solidarity with the trade unions that they had given a call for a two-day nationwide strike against the central government's privatization plans opposition members in the lok sabha sought a discussion on the issue let us understand from the perspective of civil service examination whether the right to strike can be said to be part of article 191c or not article 191c of the indian constitution mentions that all citizens shall have the right to form association or unions or cooperative societies first of all the definition of a strike comes from industrial dispute act 1947 as per IDA 1947, strike means a cessation of work by a body of persons employed in any industry acting in a combination or a concerted refusal or a refusal under a common understanding of any number of persons who are or have been so employed to continue to work or to accept employment. It is a little convoluted definition because of the jargon and the language but strike generally and plainly means stoppage of work caused by the mass refusal of employees to perform work. A strike usually takes place in response to employees' grievance. Employees generally go on strike to put pressure on the employer to accept their demands. The strike as a tool provides an opportunity for collective bargaining for the employees. Strike is a powerful tool for workmen, not only to dissolve disputes with the employer, but also helps the employees to fight against oppression of the employer. Industrial Disputes Act 1947 also defines lockouts, meaning temporary closing of a place of employment. And Section 22 of Industrial Dispute Act ordinarily prohibits strikes and lockouts for those employees employed in public utility service. Remember this fact. Industrial Dispute Act says that any person employed in a public utility service shall not go on strike in breach of contract without giving the employer notice of strike. And after giving notice, the person cannot go on strike within 14 days. And also not before the expiry of the date notified in the notice. And also not during the pendency of any conciliation proceedings. So strike as such is not banned in Industrial Dispute Act 1947 but strict regulation on strike has been provisioned for. So if the employees follow the procedure as prescribed under the law, then they can go on strike. And such strikes would be considered as legal strikes. But the Industrial Relation Code 2020 has widened the restriction on employees going for strike. As per the Industrial Dispute Act 1947, only employees of public utility services were part of the law. However, Industrial Relation Code 2020 prohibits employees of all industrial establishments from going on strike. And the code also prohibits financial aid to illegal strikes or lockouts. Prohibit here does not mean absolute prohibition. It's just the conditions that we saw in the Industrial Dispute Act, the similar conditions will apply here, but we still have the concept of legal strikes. Let's look at the Supreme Court judgment on the right to strike. In All India Bank Employees Association versus National Industrial Tribunal and others, in 1962, Supreme Court specifically held that even very liberal interpretation of Article 191C cannot lead to the conclusion that trade unions have a guaranteed right to an effective collective bargaining or to strike, either as part of collective bargaining or otherwise. Thus, and noted, there is a guaranteed fundamental right to form association or labor unions, but there is no fundamental right to go on strike.
In Radhe Sham Sharma vs. the Postmaster General Central Circle, Nagpur, 1964, Supreme Court held that as per Article 19.1a, there is no fundamental right to strike. So now you know, there is no fundamental right to strike. But strike is quite different from demonstration. Regarding strike by government servants, judicial view is that they are allowed to conduct demonstrations. But strike can be prohibited by the government. Since strike is not a fundamental right, it can be prohibited by the government. There was a rule made by the Bihar government prohibiting government servants from participating in any demonstrations or strike in connection with any matter pertaining to their conditions of service. Supreme Court ruled in this case in favor of demonstrations, but against a strike. Supreme Court said that a government servant, by accepting service conditions, does not lose his fundamental right under Article 19.1a, the right to freedom of speech and expression. Supreme Court formed an opinion that demonstration is a visible manifestation of feelings or sentiments of an individual or a group and helps in communicating one's ideas to the others. Hence, it is manifestation of right to freedom of speech and expression. So, right to demonstration falls under Article 19.1a, which is a fundamental right. So, the court declared the rules of Bihar government as not acceptable because the rules banned every type of demonstrations, however innocent. However, in line of the previous judgments that we have seen, Supreme Court upheld the rules of Bihar government which prohibited strike. The matter as it stands today is, strike is not a fundamental right. And this right can be curbed by the government. But right to demonstration is a fundamental right under Article 19.1a. And so is the right to protest. Supreme Court recently in the farm bill related judgments have observed that farmers have constitutional right to protest. Supreme Court has used the term absolutely perfect protest. And what is that? Protest that does not affect the fundamental right of others. For example, the fundamental right, right to life, right to movement of others. If the right to protest is subject to public order, protest is carried out in a non-violent manner, then it is absolutely perfect protest and that is a constitutional right. And police cannot use violent means to curve the expression of such fundamental right. This is a lead article on BIMSTEC. What we'll do here is gather information from the perspective of prelims examination on BIMSTEC. The story begins in the year 1997. Four countries came together to form our economic cooperation body. The body was initially called as BIST-EC, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand Economic Cooperation. Then later in the year, Myanmar took entry into the body and now the organization was called as BIMSTEC. In 2004, Nepal and Bhutan also got added into the body. And then for the sake of convenience or familiarity, this hyphen was removed and the body was called as BIMSTEC. But now the acronym has a changed full form and this is what it is called now. Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. BIMSTEC represents a region. The member countries are the littoral states or in the adjoining region of Bay of Bengal. It can be seen as a contiguous region from Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal. BIMSTEC also forms an important link between South and Southeast Asia. And hence, by extension, it forms an inter-regional cooperating platform between SARC and ASEAN members. Two of the members, Myanmar and Thailand, they are members of ASEAN. Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, India and Sri Lanka, they are the members of SARC. The region of BIMSTEC, the region of Bay of Bengal as such, also holds prominence because one-fourth of world traded goods cross this region. India has invested a lot with BIMSTEC countries. There are important projects running between India and BIMSTEC countries like Kaladan Multimodal Project. It links India and Myanmar. Asian Trilateral Highway or IMT Highway links India, Myanmar and Thailand. We also have BBIN Motor Vehicles Agreement among Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal for seamless flow of passenger and cargo traffic among these four nations. The strategic significance of BIMSTEC as a regional body is quite high for India. In the geostrategic sphere, India has some core policies 
and bimstick as a regional body enables india to implement these policies for example the neighborhood first policy of india these countries are at the immediate periphery of india and gives opportunity for india to take forward neighborhood first policy bimstick is also a connecting link between south asia and south east asia so it is central to act east policy of india development of north eastern state and accordingly developing relation with eastern and south eastern asia is also an important part of india's geo strategy bimstick as a platform gives opportunity for india to link its north eastern region with bangladesh myanmar thailand and onwards to asian nations over the period of time india has transition from look east policy to act east policy and the focus has got enlarged to cooperation in the indo pacific region bimstick unlike sark can be seen as part of indo pacific region some of the nations of bimstick have become very close to china for instance myanmar and thailand in particular and also sri lanka so bimstick as a cooperating body gives opportunity to india to develop better relation with these nations and counter china bimstick since is a connecting link between south asia and southeast asia between sark and asean if we get our master plan for transport connectivity ready within bimstick then that will help us to integrate india especially north eastern india with asean master plan of connectivity that is going to come up in 2025 bimstick as you would know gained prominence after 2017-18 when relationship between india and pakistan ran into bad weather india since then has used bimstick as a counter to sark so bimstick can be used as a regional cooperating body by passing pakistan but despite the potential that bimstick hold in the geo strategy realm for india still there are multiple hurdles in making bimstick a vibrant regional cooperating body first and foremost for any regional body to work the bilateral relation among the individual members that must be cordial but this exactly is not the case in bimstick for instance relationship are quite strained on again off again between india and nepal lately relationship is getting strained between india and sri lanka more and more because of tamil issue and the important projects getting cancelled bangladesh is having tough time in cooperating with myanmar when refugees are knocking on the door of bangladesh in huge numbers from the rakhine state of myanmar there are also border conflict between myanmar and thailand this is not how it works no regional body can work with immense amount of tension between individual members it is also not very clear as to how bimstick can be utilized better over and above sark because nepal and sri lanka they want revival of sark even when they are cooperating within bimstick there is always a looming danger of china's intrusion as we have mentioned before myanmar thailand and sri lanka they are very close to china and in this looming danger of china's intrusive diplomacy success of regional cooperating bodies like bimstick where few countries are very very close to china can easily be derailed then there are fundamental basic intrinsic problem with bimstack it does not hold its summit which was supposed to be held every 2 years but so far only four summits has happened and now we are preparing for the fifth one next year we will be celebrating silver jubilee of bimstack and only perhaps five summits would have happened by then apart from that we also have discussed that bimstack received attention from new delhi only after losing the workable relation with pakistan and moving away from sark during the covid-19 pandemic we have seen various regional bodies like asean sco other international organizations like g20 they have been deliberating meeting regularly but bimstack leaders they failed to do their meetings there was talk of bimstack free trade agreement it was negotiated in 2004 but there is no practical advancement on this yet bimstick countries so far mostly have been involved in humanitarian works in disaster relief activities but no considerable progress has been made on trade and economic front the negotiation on free trade agreement is lying in the cold storage there is no substantial progress in reducing non tariff or tariff barriers among the nation to increase the trade 
The regional trade utilization in BIMSTEC is only around 6%. Any regional body does not work only on the basis of security cooperation. If you look at bodies like ASEAN, SCO, there is always an important economic cooperation involved. Then there are problems and issues related with sub-regional initiatives like BCIM Forum, Forum for Bangladesh, China, India and Myanmar. China has been given a proactive membership here. So this obviously raised questions about exclusive potential of BIMSTEC. There is an article in today's newspaper, Rhino Population Up by 200 in Khaziranga. For the coming prelims examination, let's see some prelims pointer on rhinoceros. The ambitious India rhino vision that began in year 2005 has come almost to its end. And the last translocation happened recently to Manas National Park. A pair of rhinos, one male, one female, was transported to Manas National Park from Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary. You know, once upon a time, rhinos were abundant in India. Because of their sheer number, they were called as agriculture pest. But with time, the habitat lost was also enormous. And with increased poaching, the number started to shrink. So in 2005, conservationists and government, government of Assam and Bodoland Territorial Council, along with conservationist organizations like International Rhino Foundation, Worldwide Fund for Nature, and US Fish and World Wildlife Foundation, they came together to design and implement Indian Rhino Vision 2020. There were two important aims of this vision. One was to attain a population of 3,000 wild greater one-horned rhinos, also called as Indian rhinos, in seven of Assam's protected areas by 2020. This has been almost achieved. The second aim of the vision was to spread the rhinoceros population across four protected areas. Manas National Park, Lokhoa National Park, Bura Charpuri, Koch Mura Wildlife Sanctuary, and Dibru Saikhova Wildlife Sanctuary. The idea was to spread rhinoceros into these four protected areas from these three protected areas Khaziranga National Park, Orang National Park, and Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary. Especially in Khaziranga National Park and Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary, the population was to its capacity. And if the density of any species increases in one protected area, then the species come at a risk of any pest attack. It is wise to distribute the population of any species to more than 3-4 protected areas. When the translocation is happening within Assam, there will be not much change in the habitat type. And that is why this translocation target was also there under Indian Rhino Vision. But this target has not been achieved. Translocation began initially in Manas National Park, but because of poaching, all the gains were lost. Let me show you these protected areas on map. Dibru Saikova National Park, as you can see here, is northernmost and easternmost protected area in the state of Assam. If I zoom a little, you would be able to see that it is bounded by River Brahmaputra and River Lohit. If you go downstream Brahmaputra, you will find a protected area here, Lokhova Wildlife Sanctuary. You have Kaziranga National Park here and Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary here. See them carefully. Kaziranga National Park, Lokhova Wildlife Sanctuary and Pobitura Wildlife Sanctuary, they are on the southern bank of River Brahmaputra. River Brahmaputra does not flow through any of these three protected areas. On the north bank, you can cite Orang National Park. And more westward, you will find Manas National Park here. For prelims examination, you, apart from the location of protected areas, you must be aware of certain facts. Facts like there are three species of rhinoceros in Asia. Greater one Horn Rhinoceros or Indian Rhinoceros, Javan and Sumatran Rhinos. In India, we have only Great one Horn Rhinoceros and it is also called as Indian Rhinoceros. And it is also the largest of all the rhino species. Poaching is one of the greatest threat to the rhino's population. That is why when translocation was done under Indian Rhino Vision 2020, the horns of the rhinos, they were trimmed. There are five countries in which rhinoceros population are found, generally referred to as rhino range nations. They are India, Bhutan, Nepal, 
Indonesia and Malaysia. The New Delhi Declaration on Asian Rhinos 2019 was on conservation and protection of these species of rhinos. You must must know that Javan and Sumatran rhinos are critically endangered in the IUCN Red List. The Indian rhino or the great one-horned rhino is vulnerable. In India, rhinos are mostly found in Indo-Nepal Terai region and northern West Bengal and Assam. Although rhinoceros are also found in the Dudhwa Tiger Reserve in Uttar Pradesh. Now you have on your screen the answer to yesterday's question of the day. The answer is option D. All the state, all the initiatives given were for coral conservation. Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, International Coral Reef Initiative, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. All three of them concerns coral conservation. Today's question of the day is this. Which of the following cannot be said to be part of fundamental right under Article 19? Right to protest, right to demonstration, right to form trade union, or right to strike. With this, we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you very much for being with me. Goodbye. Take care.